Let's return in our Bibles to Philemon in the New Testament, right after Titus and the larger book, right before the larger book of Hebrews. Last Sunday, we began uh, looking at Philemon. It was the first part, and I'm dividing this into multiple teaching units. You might think a surprising amount for such a short letter in the New Testament, but it's because we're really in a larger series on the biblical doctrine of forgiveness. And in order for me to bring in other parts of the Bible that speak to the subject of forgiveness, I want to take the teaching units in smaller segments and fill it in so that you can receive the, the pass, as it were, from Scripture. We say, I really didn't just have an overview of Philemon, I really get the message which goes back to forgiveness. And a question that I want to ask you here at the beginning of this second message is this. What would you say to a fellow believer to prepare them to receive a very hard assignment from the Lord? Just think about that. What would you say to help them to receive that really difficult assignment that you know about because you know a little bit more of a backstory than the believer to whom you're speaking, which is sometimes the case. The reason I ask that is because this is precisely what we have in our verses. Paul's answer to that question is what he writes in these verses. He is preparing a believing friend named, named Philemon to receive what is really a hard message from the Lord to forgive someone when Forgiveness may not have even been on his radar. He may not have even been thinking about it. But you see, Paul knows a backstory that Philemon doesn't yet know about this other man. Uh, now Onesimus was a runaway slave. He is the man whom Philemon is going to forgive. Onesimus has since become a believer in Christ. Paul led him to faith in Christ. And how... He is received, how Onesimus is received when he goes back to Colossae, back into the house of Philemon. That is going to speak volumes about the power of the gospel to restore forgiven sinners, repentant sinners. Now we've already considered the historical background of the letter as well as the introduction in the first three verses. And this morning we're getting into the first part of the main body of Philemon, which is verses 4 to 7, where Paul wisely and I think persuasively commends all of the good associations surrounding this man Philemon in the church at Colossae. What Paul is really doing here to set him up for success, and that's really what we are called to do to help other believers to set one another up to be obedient to Christ, to succeed in living out the gospel. Paul is going to remind Philemon of the Christ-like character traits that he already has in his life. He's already shown these things. This is to prepare Philemon to embrace the higher call to forgive when, as I said, I don't think forgiveness was even on the radar of his life. He wasn't thinking about it. You know, he had a runaway slave. He's gone. That's a personal matter. He's not thinking in terms of, of forgiveness yet because he doesn't know everything that's going on. But this is a gospel imperative, we're going to find out, and all Christians need to see it as such. And therefore, it's not just about Paul and Philemon and Onesimus. It now is about us. This is about us right here on this second Sunday of July in the 21st century. So we are here and this is something that we need to receive as believers. So with this as background, let's look at verses 4 to 7 together. And we will begin with this as our official reading. And now if you're physically able to do so, in honor of God and his word, please stand with me for the reading of these verses. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Verse 4 begins, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because of the heart's of the saints have been refreshed through you. Please pray with me. 
Father, we need these truths. We, we see their relevance for us that shine brightly when we look beneath the surface and slow down just a little bit to see how we as forgiven sinners have much to forgive. Give us ears to hear and hearts to believe what your word reveals, that we may take gospel magnifying action that leads to restoration and health in our relationships. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. In the Christian frame of reference, forgiveness in the heart really is ground zero. It's ground zero for where the battle over forgiveness is going to be fought and either won or lost. And whether it's won or lost is really a matter of whether we're going to take what our Lord teaches through these words and others in the New Testament, whether we're going to just check them off as mental, intellectual things that we say, yeah, I believe that, or whether we're going to go the next step and to say, here's where I need to put this into practice. That's where the battle really happens. It's in that moment where you say, this is one of those times, isn't it? And I want you to recognize whatever that moment is for you. If forgiveness is the goal, and it is, we see in, in the Bible it is, then the obstacles to overcome are things like resentment, distrust, thoughts of vengeance, uh, re retribution maybe, or just continued cold unforgiveness and maybe a brooding anger. So many potential obstacles to overcome. But if you are a believer, and I speak when I say this exclusively to those in Christ, if you're a believer, you have right now everything you need resident in you through the indwelling spirit to do everything that is being presented here. You have everything that is needed to win this battle, and it all begins in your heart and mind. Now, let me bring in some other truth about forgiveness. And this is, I think this is a scary truth among others that our Lord shared in Matthew 6, where Jesus says in the 14th and 15 verses of Matthew 6 that we must forgive others or our Heavenly Father won't forgive us. Now, what on earth does that mean if we're speaking in the context of believers? Well, obviously, this does not mean we lose our justification. It doesn't mean that our, our sins aren't forgiven in the sense that Christ is already, if we're believers, he's forgiven all of our sins, past, present, and future. They're already positionally locked in. They're locked in. That faith in Christ cannot be lost if it's true, if it's genuine. So what does Jesus mean that if we don't forgive others, then the Heavenly Father won't forgive us our sins? And I think the context, uh, if we look at it carefully, doctrinally, the context, if you're talking about a believer, then, then Jesus is speaking here of a chastening experience with God the Father who disciplines his disobedient children. In this case, the disobedience would be, I am not going to forgive, even though God the Father says, I must. That would be the instance of disobedience. And so we enter, at that point, a chastening experience. Doesn't mean we lose our salvation, doesn't mean that, that none of our sins are forgiven, but it's talking about that relational sense of parental love with the Father that we have on an ongoing daily basis in this temporal realm called life. So we're not talking about the positional status of a justified believer. But we are talking about what Jesus described when he told a parable in Matthew 18 about the servant who was forgiven this massive debt. You remember, it was like millions of dollars in our day, a massive debt, and then he is forgiven, and he's, he's so glad that he doesn't have to go to debtor's prison. And then what does he do? He goes out. And he finds another servant who owes him several thousand dollars and he has him hauled off to prison. Now we know that 
Jesus, through the parable, rebukes that servant and says, you wicked servant, that you were forgiven of all of this huge debt, and then you go out and, and you hail this other believer, this fellow servant, off to prison because he can't pay you back the thousands that you owed when you've been forgiven of millions. It's a picture of that in relationship to the Father. We need, we all need, not just a justification, but a daily cleansing. We need that ongoing forgiveness as we confess known sins before the Father. It's what we could call parental forgiveness. And so this is not about our justification. This is about our relationship with God as obedient followers of Christ. And another picture to help us understand the cleansing aspect is if you think of justification as the full bath where you're fully cleansed by God in that full positional sense, then the ongoing daily cleansing would be analogous to foot washing in the first century where they, they didn't have to take a new bath over and over again, but it was sufficient to do just the foot washing to have that cleanness that was most necessary in the relationship to others. And you remember that Jesus taught Peter about that at the foot washing in John 13.10 where this is about the difference between needing a full bath as opposed to a simple foot washing to be cleansed. And the idea here, the application would be, keep short accounts. Keep short accounts with God and with others. We all need this. That's the general idea. We all need forgiveness. We all need to forgive others. And so Paul, who knows the backstory, is preparing Philemon through a letter that he's writing by appealing to all the good that he's been doing as a true believer. Now this reminds us that flattery is sinful. It's wrong to flatter people. That is, to set them up by inflating their ego so that you can ask something and you're like manipulating them. This is not that. This is legitimate praise. Paul is not buttering Philemon up. But he is giving legitimate praise. And keep in mind that when something is true and you point it out, it, it ennobles that person. It, it underscores what is good and right. It, it's like legitimate praise for something that is good is preparing him to keep doing it. You know, that which gets rewarded typically gets repeated. This is so true in life. Uh, I think about this in my own house. Anytime uh, I receive some legitimate praise or congratulations for something that I might have done right, it makes me want to do it more and more. And, and I don't think I'm the only one like that. I think this is true to the way we are built in our nature. And when my kids are at home and I'm trying to teach them to do different things and they do something for me, but it's not the way I would have done it, Maybe it's not as full or as completely as I might have wanted it done. I have to be very careful not to come in with criticism at that moment, but to say, at a boy or at a girl, as much as I can, even though it's not done to the extent that I might have wanted it to be done, because why? I don't want to blight the very fruit of character that I'm laboring to grow in my children's hearts. And I think there's a sense of that in our relationship with all other people. We, we don't want to crush people. We want to encourage them while still pointing out what needs to change, what does need to be improved. Otherwise, a, a critical comment can ruin it. It can close the door, close the spirit. But acts that are commended usually get repeated. And so Paul is now commending the true elements of good character in Philemon's life. And as we go through these verses, I want you to notice, if you're taking notes, there are five aspects of the heart here, five aspects of the heart that Paul draws out in these verses. And the first is this. Notice first, a heart for the Lord. A heart for the Lord. We see this in verses 4 and 5, where Paul writes, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. If you ever studied the uh, 
writing styles, the interpersonal communication of first century letters, you would discover that the way Paul begins this letter is considered typical of the way you would begin an interpersonal letter in the first century. I mean, it's rather customary. It's a way to move into the, a letter of any kind. It's like the entry hall of the letter. In both pagan and Christian letters of the first centuries, the uh, word of address and the introduction were usually, though not always, followed by expressions of thanksgiving or even a prayer such as these. Now, Paul uses a fuller form of his thanksgiving here in verses 4 and 5, where he is thankful to God, we know that, but he also tells us when he gives thanks, always in my prayers. I am always thankful in my prayers. And then he mentions why he does so. It's because I hear about your love and your faith. Paul is the one who brought Philemon to faith. He's like the, the spiritual father on earth who told Philemon the gospel several years before this. And it's a celebration here of their mutual heart for the Lord. They got to know each other. Uh, Paul knew Philemon and he knew his heart. Uh, I think, though I don't have any scriptures to, to back this up, but I, I think because of the amount of time that Paul spent in Ephesus, which was at least three years training the Ephesian elders, which we read about in Acts 19 and 20, he was there in that region. Uh, Colossae is about 130 miles east of Ephesus. Est Ephesus is more on the coast of Asia Minor, now modern-day Turkey. And so I imagine they would have met around Ephesus. When Paul was there, there would be many reasons for Philemon to have been there. And Timothy was there with them. And they worked together. They must have talked together. They heard the gospel that Paul was preaching. And Philemon comes to faith, and now he knows the Lord Jesus. You know, Ephesus really was the mother church of Asia Minor. Ephesus was like the model church that planted all the other churches in Asia Minor, including the Colossian church. And the Colossian church began meeting in the home of this man Philemon and his wife, Aphia. And Paul knows a lot about Philemon, and it's all positive. So he's not flattering Philemon, but he's just reminding him of all these positive things that he's seen. There's no critical language here that might suggest that uh, Philemon forgiving Onesimus is going to be a hard proposition. There's no sense of that. It's Rather, he's uh, addressing a willing spirit, uh, a spirit that anticipates his full obedience to Scripture. You know, Philemon knew about forgiveness because he had been forgiven of a massive debt in, in Christ by having his sins forgiven. Uh, Philemon, as a believer, he knew that Jesus had forgiven much of his, in his life, and that's a greater debt than he would ever be owed by Onesimus. And, you know, forgiveness is the entry point of the Christian life. It's how we all come into the Christian life is through forgiveness in Christ. Back when we studied our, our Lord's parable of the father and his two sons, back at the first three Sundays of June, we went through and we saw in that parable the amazing, lavish way that God the Father forgives us. And we called it vertical forgiveness from God to us. And now we're looking at Philemon to see an illustration of horizontal forgiveness and how it plays out in our lives. But it's all grace. It is all unmerited favor from God. If you've ever had to forgive someone, and I think almost all of us have, we've all been hurt, you've undoubtedly had this thought go through your mind at the first stage of processing how to handle it. But they don't deserve to be forgiven. They don't, they haven't earned it. They won't appreciate it. They don't deserve it. That's the idea, that they don't deserve it. Surely, I'm not the only one who has ever thought that. I think this is common. This has to be one of the early thoughts. They don't deserve it. Listen to what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said. Do you think that you deserve forgiveness? If you do, 
he said, you are not a Christian. To divorce forgiveness of sins from the actual living of the Christian life is nothing but rank heresy. So it's all grace. It's all grace for me. It's all grace for you. And yes, it's all grace in our interpersonal relationships with others. We've been forgiven of millions, billions that we have owed. It's all been forgiven. And now people owe us thousands and hundreds and tens. And it's all grace. We must forgive it all. And so Paul reminds Philemon of his heart for the Lord already demonstrated in his life. And the first trait Paul mentions for one who forgives is a heart for the Lord. This man loves Jesus. But then notice the second trait. It's a heart for fellow believers. We see this also in verse 5 where God says through Paul, Because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. So Paul knew about Philemon's faith, which he had toward the Lord Jesus. That was obvious. That was manifest. As a forgiven believer, Philemon became increasingly concerned about the Lord. Uh, he's a man who wants to please Jesus. And you could see it by the way he lived his life. You could tell by the way he ran the home and by how generous he was with the Colossian believers who met in his house. As believers, you and I want to please Jesus. I know we do. We want to please him, please him not just out of fear, but out of love. Because we truly love the Lord Jesus. Because the Lord has forgiven us the way the Lord has forgiven Philemon of all of his sins. And now he and we are enabled to forgive others of anything, yes, anything they do to us in this life. Another thing Martin Lloyd-Jones said is, true forgiveness breaks a man and he must forgive. In other words, when we truly process what Jesus has forgiven in us, it breaks us. When we really get it and the penny drops, we say, wow, I have been forgiven of a debt far greater than any that will ever come for me to forgive. And so we are broken. In other words, he's saying true forgiveness now for us comes from the heart and the Lord enables his people to forgive like he forgives. Now that's quite a statement. That we can forgive in our own temporal way as fallen creatures saved by grace. We can forgive the way in which he forgives. Now that sets the stage for something immense. This is not talking about something small or paltry. This is talking about massive weights of debt to be forgiven. And sometimes the bigger the forgiveness is, the more the gospel can potentially shine in that story. There are some stories that, that are so amazing that they just grab the attention of the whole world. In 2018, there was a Dallas news story that went viral. And some of you may have seen this. You may remember this. And it went viral because it was an astonishing act of forgiveness. No one saw it coming. It was a criminal trial for a Dallas police woman who, after a 13-hour shift, came back to her apartment exhausted and confused. She got off on the wrong floor of her building and went to the place where she thought her apartment was, but she was on the floor above, and she entered another man's apartment, thinking that it was her apartment. She shot him dead. She killed him in cold blood, an innocent, unarmed man in his apartment. And at the trial, the victim's brother, who was a believer, forgave the officer who shot his brother. But he didn't just stop there. He also told her that he wants the best for her and that he wanted her to receive Christ and to know full forgiveness from God because that's what he said his brother would have wanted from this. Because his brother was a worship leader at their church. And these boys loved the Lord. And then he said something that astonished everyone in the courtroom. He said, may I hug the defendant. 
And the judge said yes. And even the judge was wiping tears from her eyes as those two embraced in front of the judge in that courtroom. And all you could hear were gasps and tears and cameras clicking. And it was an amazing scene of reality that is being played out before the cameras. Just an astonishing act of forgiveness. Forgiveness is powerful. And the more costly a forgiveness is, the more it can magnify the beauty of the gospel in those who love Jesus. The Holy Spirit provides the enablement for us to forgive. Maybe you're saying, I don't have that ability. I, I could never do that. No, you couldn't right now do that because you haven't been called to do that. I haven't been called to do that. But do you think Jesus could give you that ability at the moment that you need it? Do you think that it's just possible that God could give you the grace that you need in the moment? Yes. We all say yes. We have to say that Jesus is able to do that in me. Yes, even me. Philemon has a moment now where Paul is saying, God has already given you what you need to do what I'm about to ask you to do. He has already been empowered to do hard things that are right and necessary. And I'm telling you, the grammar in verse 5 backs this up. If you look at it carefully, the present tense of echo, translated you have, shows the ongoing nature of Philemon's concern for pleasing the Lord in other areas. Philemon's unwavering faith in the past gave Paul confidence in his willingness to forgive in both the present as well as the future. In verse 5, Paul reminds Philemon of his reputation of love and faith toward both the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. Look again at verse 5. Because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. You know, the form of love used here is not phileo, the, the normal everyday word. It's the word agape. Agape love. That's the godly, sacrificial love of will, the love of choice. And this is the kind of love born of God's Spirit. It's also one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. It's a mark of true faith in the heart of Christ's people. And this love issues in faith toward Jesus and for all the saints. So we can love unlovely fellow sinners because of the love of the loveliest one in the universe has bestowed on us. And so we become conduits of his love. We're not the ones who produce it. We're not the manufacturers of the love. No, we don't have it in us. He puts, us, puts it in us and he works it through us. It's his power through us. We become the conduits of his love. It's a beautiful image of how he uses us. And so from a heart for the Lord, coupled with a heart for fellow believers, we come third now to a heart for fellowship. A heart for fellowship in verse 6. Verse 6 says, And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. The original word behind the English word for sharing is koinonia, very familiar common Greek word. It's generally a reference to fellowship based on mutual love. Now, when you read that on the surface, it sounds like it's kind of a, a passing reference to evangelism, that we're sharing our faith. And I believe there is a reference to evangelism here, but I think it's secondary. I don't think that's the primary meaning that Paul has when he writes these words. The first concern in verse 6 is not sharing your faith with the lost. It's sharing the faith with the saved. It's how we, we, we will put it in these words, it's how we do life. We do life together and we share the commonness of our faith with one another, doing life together in a fallen world, upholding each other in our burdens and our griefs, celebrating the joys and the triumphs. Yes, praise God, you shared your faith. Yes, praise God, he is answering our prayers. And we're doing life together in that sense. That is what he means in the context of fellow believers and sharing your faith. 
And it's the sense of doing life together. You're sharing your faith and life together with other believers in this world. And so this word fellowship, koinonia, means much more than simply enjoying each other's company over a meal in Wilson Hall, as wonderful as that is. That's really the secondary aspect. It's about all of life. It's not just breaking bread once every month or every quarter of the year. It is a mutual sharing of all parts of life. This word could also be translated belonging, that we belong to each other because of Christ. Now the concern for fellowship becomes the motivation for Philemon to fully forgive and restore this man Onesimus. Now remember, Onesimus was lost when he stole goods and ran away from Philemon's house. He was not a believer. That means the Colossian church probably knew Onesimus. I mean, they knew him. They saw his face. He was around the house. He was on what we would call the perimeter of the church. He would maybe pass in and out of the room while they're gathering for church. But he was never a part of the church. Now he's a part of the church in absentia because he hasn't come back yet. And he's coming back now with this letter. And Paul is saying now he's going to be in the church. He's not going to be on the perimeter anymore. He's going to be in the service, in the gathering with other believers, and you guys have got to forgive him. You have got to restore him. And so koinonia here means he belongs. He is one of you in the fullest sense of being in Christ. So Onesimus was lost, and now he is a new believer in the church. And through publicly forgiving this runaway slave, Onesimus, Philemon is going to maintain the grace and the peace and the unity of the entire Colossian church and be an example for generations to come, even today. He is an example and an illustration for us, even today. In my family, with the kids, my wife and I had the practice for many years, since we just had Matthew, our oldest, we started having family devotionals. My wife and I did this uh, together, and then when we had our first son, we started to say, let's just start including him, even though he doesn't understand what we're doing and why we're doing it in front of him. But we started doing it. And over the years, we added four more children until we had five children, and we began having a family devotional. Usually, it's after dinner and before bedtime. Sometimes it's in the morning, but not always. And it used to include a lot more music because we would sing after we would do the devotional. And there were a couple of standards that came out of our collection of singing a cappella in the bedrooms at night. One of them was Low in the Grave He Lay, the great Easter song. And then the other one, which was always around Christmas, was O Holy Night. And I have sung both of those two songs so many times, and we love them. And we would mix those in with other songs that we would teach the children. Now, when you think about it, and I know we're far from Christmas, but you think about O Holy Night and the second stanza. It sounds like it was drawn from Philemon. Now, listen to these lyrics. Truly, he taught us to love one another. His law is love, and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy, in grateful chorus raise we, let all within us praise his holy name. Christ is the Lord. Oh, praise his name forever. His power and glory evermore proclaim. Amen. This is the message of Philemon. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in Christ's name all oppression shall cease. And so these words are like a lyrical rendering of what Paul is saying here to Philemon and to us in these verses. This heart for bondage-breaking love and fellowship among believers is rooted entirely in God's grace, God's unmerited favor, not on our performance.
I went to Dallas Seminary, as did Pastor Gary, and at Dallas Seminary every year they host a week of lectures that are in memory of W.H. Griffith Thomas. And this great Bible teacher, Griffith Thomas, once said, Love is the outgoing of the entire nature in self-sacrificing service. Let me say that again. Love is the outgoing of the entire nature in self-sacrificing service. That's a huge statement. That's comprehensive. Now, I have seen wave after wave of this here in this church just since I've moved here. We have seen so many examples of an outpouring since we moved back to Memphis and joined this body of believers. My family has. We experienced this in Oklahoma, too, but we've seen it so much already here at this church. But his love and concern for fellow believers gave him, Philemon, the motivation and the spiritual enablement to forgive anyone of anything. And Paul is just reminding him in this setup that he has already been equipped to do what is about to be asked of him. And Paul led this runaway slave to Christ, sends him back with this letter as a newly redeemed man on a mission, and all forgiven people are blessed to be a blessing. Forgiveness would also make Onesimus a useful leader. And by the way, that's a play on words because useful is what Onesimus means. It literally means useful. And it's been a joke because up until now, he's not been seen as very useful. He was the runaway. But now we're going to learn that now he truly is going to live up to that name. And we'll see that in verse 11. But verse 6 is full of evangelistic motivations once we understand the basic sharing of faith with other believers. Now listen to verse 6 again. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Now the word effective here translates energes, from which we get our word energy. Now it literally means powerful, but I want you to get the image. What Paul is saying to Philemon is, when you do what I'm about to ask you to do in forgiving this person who has hurt you, who has grieved you and betrayed you, it's going to light up the church. It's going gonna, it's gonna to set a light on a hill for all the churches and all the pagan world is going to see this light. You think it's a small light, but I'm telling you, in Christ, it's a lifted high light that is going to be so bright that generations for thousands of years are going to see it and celebrate the gospel. It's going to send a powerful message to the entire world about the importance of forgiving and the value of loving fellowship among Christians of every rank and station. Whenever we forgive a fellow believer, no matter what they've done against us, it makes a strong statement of our concern for fellowship and of our love for Christ. Our love for Christ is really what it exemplifies. So there's a heart for the Lord. We see that in verses 4 and 5. There's a heart for fellow believers, verse 5, and a heart for fellowship. That's verse 6. And so we come forth now to a heart for knowledge. That's the fourth one, a heart for knowledge. And this is from the second part of verse 6. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. The word epignosis, knowledge, in verse 6 refers to a deep, rich, full, but here's the key word, experiential knowledge. This is about first-hand knowledge, personal knowledge that you don't get by reading a book. You don't get it by just hearing a lecture or even listening to a sermon. You get it when you do it. This is experiential knowledge. You know, the same is true of the Bible. You can't really know the Bible unless you actually read it. You pick it up and you read it and you process the truths of Scripture and you apply it to your life. It requires direct contact. And you know, it's really the same with other believers as we relate to one another. We might have many acquaintances, but we don't really know each other until we do life together. 
in various ways. And that takes place over time. And so until Philemon actually forgives, he has no experiential knowledge of forgiveness as Scripture requires. It's just a, a theoretical, abstract truth that's in his doctrinal statement, but you can't say, I actually know what that means until you've done it. And so obedience comes through taking action in faith. And when we take action in faith, we are helping to edify the entire church. You think maybe this is just between you and another person? No. I want to remind you that it's really about the whole church. The whole congregation is blessed when any two people in it, any one person really, is blessed. It blesses the whole body, even when our actions seem very small and very hidden. I, don't, I want to remind you of how important small actions are. Some of you may remember the name Dr. Peter Marshall. He died at the end of the 1940s, but he was at one time the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. He was from Scotland. He came over to America. And when he was the chaplain of the Senate, Dr. Peter Marshall once prayed these words, Lord, help us to remember that small deeds done are better than great deeds merely planned. That is so true. Small deeds done are better than great deeds merely planned. Let us not despise the day of small deeds, of small things, taking small steps forward toward Christ and toward each other. God works in the small stuff, and every great movement of God's people has always started with small, sometimes seemingly unnoticed acts of faithfulness in the common hours of daily life. And embracing this opens us up to a heart for receiving more and more knowledge, first-hand knowledge in Christ. In these verses, we see a heart for the Lord, a heart for fellow believers, a heart for fellowship, and a heart for knowledge. And now, fifth, a heart for joyful blessing. That's in verse 7. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Whenever a believer comforts or lifts the burden of a fellow believer, even if nobody else sees it, the entire church is blessed. I've seen it. It's like the, the wind, the wind that refreshes the brow of a tired, overworked deckman on a boat is the same wind that can get that sail full and drive it forward across the sea. The same breeze that refreshes the deckman fills that sail and drives the entire ship forward. That's the way it is in the church. When we lift the burden, however small, of one believer, it lifts the entire body of Christ in that church. And Paul says he derives much joy and comfort from Philemon's love for all the saints who have been, note these words, refreshed through his outpouring of love. Refreshing is a ministry of grace. And you do it. You know this. And hearts here translates the word spelonkna. It's not the cardia heart. It's spelonkna, which literally refers to the bowels. He's talking about the deepest feelings in a person. We would say it's our gut. I, I feel this in my gut. People in the church are struggling. A lot of us are struggling. We might not talk about it, but there are struggles on every pew. There's suffering. There's hurt. There, there are financial burdens. And Paul is saying, you Philemon have refreshed all of those. You've lifted all of those type of burdens in Colossae. And that word refreshed is from anapao. I think this is a very vivid image. It's a military term that refers to a group of soldiers taking a break after a heavy season of marching. Anapao. They're, they're taking a break and Paul is saying, you do that for the weary believers in the church at Colossae. You, you give people a break. You're like a refreshing wind. You are like somebody that the Holy Spirit is using to wipe the, the perspired brow of a, lay, a, a very weary laborer. 
Philemon brought weary, troubled people rest. He brought renewal. He gave them time. He was a peacemaker. That is the example for every believer in Christ. And now, I've told you what these verses mean. I've passed it. Do you receive it? This is the hope that I have set you up for all of the good actions that Jesus would have you do in these coming days before we meet again. You've heard the truth of God's word. And to understand these verses is really to understand the heart of forgiveness. Let's pray together. Father, we, we have been so blessed together to hear your word, to have fellowship and communication and love sharing with each other on this second Sunday of July. And we who have faith in your son are really being asked to do something that you've already enabled. And we owe everything to your saving love that has redeemed us from deserved wrath and hell forever. We are wrath-deserving sinners, but you have forgiven us. And you have not just tolerated us, but you have welcomed us with an open embrace. You have forgiven us of every sin, past, present, and future. Help us to live now as forgiven forgivers and blessed to be a blessing to each other as your ambassadors here on earth. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.